Um, apologies to uh, from a Professor Gilbert, who um, unfortunately wasn't able to chair for this evening. So it's just asked me as another breast radiologist to chair. Um, so I have great delight in um, saying welcome to Falak Masood, who's uh, been a consultant with us in the breast unit and, and also doing obviously general radiology. Everyone knows her, she's been a registrar here. She's been a consultant now for a, a year and um, she has chosen the subject on breast implants um, and it's the challenges and imaging pitfalls. So actually, I think implants is a, a really, although you might think it's a little bit niche for breast, we see ladies with implants on all sorts of imaging now and uh, understanding um, you know, what type of implants they are and um, you know, their relationship to silica nodes and all these other things is really important to be able to then decide if they're normal or abnormal and, and appropriately refer on uh, if needed. So I think it's a really important topic. Um, so thank you, uh, Falak, um, and um, I hope everyone enjoys the lecture. Thanks, Penny. Um, so we're just exactly we're going to be talking about breast implants um, and they can occasionally be a bit of a challenge, um, uh, both from imaging and sort of teasing apart what's happening. So um, and you will come across them in some of other modalities as incentive findings. So I thought it was worth talking about. Um, does anyone know who this gentleman is in the middle of the screen? Um, so his name, anyone online? No. Um, so his name is, I'm going to butcher this, but Vincent Cerny. Um, so he was a um, German surgeon and he um, came, he, he'd been sort of revolutionary in a range of surgeries. So he formed the first total abdominal hysterectomy by the vagina in 1879. Um, and in 1895, he um, was the first person to transport, uh, transplant um, a lipoma from a woman's back onto her right anterior chest wall after a mastectomy. So that's kind of, he's kind of seen as the father of constructive breast surgery. Um, and since then, you know, a whole range of things have been tried. Um, in the early 1900s, we were injecting paraffin wax. We'd melt it and then inject it into breast. And um, this is now banned um, in the UK and in other regions of the world, but sometimes it does still occur. Um, I hadn't realized that in, in the 1940s, silicon injections were really popular. Um, a lot of uh, apparently Japanese prostitutes had this done to them against their will um, and some really disastrous consequences. So both the paraffin and the free silicon injections can cause really horrible complications, tissue necrosis, infection. You can get sinus tract infections, um, and then it can migrate to all over the body. Um, in the 1950s, we came up with this idea that we can use polyvinylic alcohol sponge and transplant that. Um, that also had disastrous consequences. So um, in the 1960s, um, we came up with um, sort of encapsulated silicon prosthesis. And from then on, it's kind of um, snowballed and we're now sort of on the fourth, fifth generation of um, implants. Around the 1970s, saline implants came um, along. Sorry, it's not moving. Um, so the kind of um, key reasons why we would put an implant into a woman um, on capacity reconstruction, that's about 20% of the implants that we put in. Um, also developmental disorders, if there's a genesis of one breast, um, and um, the majority is done for um, elective reasons, um, sort of aesthetic reasons, enhanced self-image, gender reassignment. Um, so the kind of the majority, about 60 percent of implants that we put in are silicon implants, um, the remainder being saline. We don't really use um, PAG in this country. It's something you'll see from South America um, and in China, but it's not really used here. Um, the, major the majority are single lumen implants, um, but we do have some multiple lumens that you'll see. So um, normally you have silicon in the inner layer and saline on the outer layer. Um, the majority ones that we see here, because it's after um, reconstructive breast surgery, um, they're called inverse double lumens. You'll see saline on the inside linked to an expander port, so you can increase the size of the implant, and silicon in the outer lumen. There are such things as triple lumen implants, but they're extremely rare, and we rarely see them. Um, since 2016, there's a breast and cosmetic implant registry. So this is after the whole PIP scandal um, back in 2010. So now every implant, whether it's in the NHS or private sector, is recorded so we know what kind of implants been put in. 
Um, and the other way to kind of differentiate implants is their location. So are they placed um, behind the glandular tissue in front of the pectoralis muscle, or has it been placed in between pec major and pec minor is the kind of subpectoral type of implant. Um, so the reason implants kind of do form actually quite a big bulk of our work is because there are both quite early complications like seromas, hematomas, infection, um, but also quite commonly we end up dealing with the late complications as well. So capsular contraction is extremely common, um, but also they can have bulges in the contour, um, herniation through the fibrous capsule, and um, the implant can migrate, um, it can rupture, um, and we see all sorts of complications, including siliconadenopathy and very, very rarely cancer. Um, and they can form a real challenge with diagnosis as well. So um, saline implants are usually easier to handle with diagnosis, but silicon implants really causes trouble. And we end up often using MRIs, the most um, sensitive and specific test to assess silicon implants, um, to assess for rupture, but also to assess for other complications as well. Um, the real challenge from our end is, is it a breast pathology or is it an implant related pathology? So having an implant also reduces the sensitivity of how good a mammogram is um, to find cancer. So the challenges are both kind of twofold, like it's harder to find cancers and find other benign pathology, but it's also um, harder to tease out what's related to the implant. Um, the two kind of key types of rupture that we'll talk about just briefly will be um, intra and extra capsular rupture. We use those terms quite a lot. It's just good to have an understanding of what they mean. So the majority of patients have intracapsular ruptures. So when you implant a ca an implant capsule into a woman's breast, it forms a natural, um, you've got the implant shell, which is made of silicon, and then your body forms a natural fibrous capsule around it. In intracapsular rupture, that shell ruptures, but the fibrous capsule is intact. Um, and because that fibrous capsule is intact, the silicon still remains kind of where it's sort of supposed to be. Um, and it doesn't freely extravasate around the body. Um, whereas an extracapsular rupture, the um, fibrous capsule has also ruptured, so the one that your body made against um, the implant. Um, so extracapsular rupture implies the shell has ruptured and the fibrous capsule has ruptured. Intracapsular rupture can be really hard to find, both clinically, because often the contour hasn't changed with the breast, the patient often doesn't even know they've had it. Um, whereas um, in extracapsular rupture, you can sometimes see it even on the mammogram, but often the patient will notice a change um, in how the implant feels and the shape of the breast. Um, and there's sort of a whole range of findings, but normal thing is what you want is a completely um, intact um, inner shell and outer fibrous capsule. You can get things called radial folds, often as that kind of capsule contracts around, you might get the folds and these are usually double thickness folds, and I'll show you some examples of what that looks like. Um, there are some signs that can be suspicious for rupture, which means you should probably do some more imaging. And um, so things like the keyhole sign, um, the new sign, teardrop sign, I'll show you some more examples of what that looks like. But essentially, um, you can actually see, you know, parts of the implant capsule may have folded in on itself, but then it's not intact. It's not intact with the um, inner shell. And then the kind of really classic thing that we say is this linguini sign where you just see a free floating membrane in the um, implant. That's really um, characteristic of intracapsular rupture. Silicon outside the fibrous capsule is what we're looking for in MR to suggest extracapsular rupture. Um, so they are challenging because physical examination isn't, doesn't always give you the answer. Um, we can use mammography, we can use ultrasound, but really the best test is MRI. It's incredibly sensitive and specific. Um, MRI, more so for silicon implants. Um, I'll show you saline implants, actually you can just work out clinically and from the mammogram. Um, but what I'm also going to do, uh, strangely, is I'm going to touch on CT. So obviously CT is not the modality to assess breast implants on, but it is a modality that, you know, someone with an asymptomatic intracapsular rupture we're going to be seeing it all the time. So it's just good to have an idea of what to look out for and uh, what's normal and what's not so normal. Um, so mammograms, their main role is to detect cancer. So, um, and as I mentioned, so it, implants can make that trickier, but we've got various things we can do. We have something called the Eklund views, which is where we can displace the implant backwards and try to take a mammogram of the tissue there. That was developed in 1988. Um, Salon implants are more loosened at mammograms, so you can often sort of see through them more easily, whereas silicon implants are really dense and can make it quite tricky. Um, so this is an example of what saline implants look like. These are just the MLO views. 
Um, but as you can see, they're just slightly more loosened than um, silicon implants. Uh, so silicon implants look a lot more dense on the mammogram. And it's much harder to tell if it's ruptured on the mammogram, but occasionally you can see like some funny densities on there. Um, so this is an example of a dual lumen implant and ultrasound. So this outer bit in this patient is silicon and this inner bit, inner, inner lumen is saline, both anechoic and ultrasound. So it's really hard to tell them apart on the ultrasound alone. Um, so this is the implant shell and then the body forms a capsule outside that. Um, and on MRI, the kind of key sequences we use is a silicon suppression sequence and a water suppression, both T2 stir sequences. Um, and also we use a T2 rated sequence as well, which I'll show you some examples of that. Um, so this is what the axial T2 looks like. This is a patient with, um, was, was actually born with a gen complete agenesis of the left breast and had implants inserted. And um, these implants are about 13 years old, they're completely intact. Um, and this is what an intact implant would look like on an MRI. So uh, on the T2, we can see the capsule is completely intact. Um, we're not seeing any abnormal kind of strands. You might have a few folds, but they'll be sort of double thickness. Um, this is also a fold, so I realize it's a misleading image. Um, but this is what, so on the water suppression, the silicon is really bright. And we'll scroll through this and see if any of that silicon is outside of the capsule. And on the silicon suppression sequence, um, we can also see um, if any silicon's outside and also see where the saline is. And often you can pick up things like the salad oil sign. Um, and we look at each breast in sagittal reformats as well. It's just slightly more sensitive in picking up silicon that's outside the capsule. Um, so just to touch on um, that, what a normal implant would look like on CT. So these are single lumen implants. The implant capsule is intact and got nice homogeneous um, silicon filling this implant, and there's on this CT there was no silicon outside of the fibrous capsule. Um, and so normal variants are these kind of little things here. These are double thickness radial folds. Um, they're not worrying, um, and they're all in keeping with an intact implant. Um, and you know we can see them. I don't know if you can appreciate the sort of double thickness of them on that sagittal view. Um, double lumen implants. So this is another example of the, an expander implant. So the inner um, lumen is saline and the outer lumen is silicon. Um, and this patient had um, a previous prosthetic silicon implant as well. Um, and this is what they looked like on the water suppression sequences. Um, and this is another example of a double lumen implant. So on the silicon sequence, uh, sorry, the water suppression sequence, um, you can see the silicon is really bright and it's all still within the capsule. Um, and on the water silicon suppression, you can see that this that central silicon on the sagittal view um, is of low signal intensity. Um, so I'm just going to start with um, just some cases to show you kind of the kind of range of things that we can see. So this is a woman um, who's had a bilateral retropectoral implants in for about 13 years um, after um, sort of breast surgery. Um, and she's com complaining of increasing pain. Um, so her implants are completely intact. Um, so in her case, the pain was associated with capsular contracture. So the surgeons grade this from one to four on examination, but it can cause all sorts of real problems to the patient, which may think they may think it's ruptured, but it's actually just the capsules contracting and it's become tight and stiff and it can cause pain, asymmetry, misshapen breast. Um, they grade it from one to five. So we've got one to four here, but four being, you know, really severe deformity of the breast and grade one being that they can't feel really any change in the implant, maybe just a little bit stiffer. Um, but this is a, a large proportion of the patients we see in clinic um, coming through. Um, this is that same case of saline implants I showed you earlier, but this is them three years later. Um, so anyone want to hazard a guess at what's happened? I'll show you that. So this is the mammogram in 2013, and on the right is the mammogram in 2016. So, I mean, she could have had it taken out, but what are the chances she should have just had one side taken out? Um, so this is her CC view. Um, so this is really common with saline implants. We had an ectomy view, but of the right breast only. Um, so 
when saline implants um, rupture, this is her when we took the implants out in theatre, when saline implants rupture, they kind of collapse on themselves. Our body is really good at reabsorbing the saline. So you, um, the best description I've seen of it in the literature is like, imagine a crumpled up sandwich bag and then like shove it at the back of the press. That's what it can look like. So they've got a nice picture of this from Radiopedia, but um, often when it shrinks, it just collapses right away. So you might not even see it on the mammogram. So that was just her screening mammogram. And you know she didn't even notice for some reason that it had um, deflated. And um, so they're much safer in that sense. Your body just reabsorbs it and we just need to go in and take the capsule out. Um, this is what they can look like on CT as well, just like kind of collapsed sandwich bags kind of appearance. Um, but because the body's so good at reabsorbing the saline, they kind of just, you know, deflate, but you don't get all the kind of complications that you get with silicon. Um, this is another female patient who's noticed, this time she's noticed changes in both the breasts. Um, so on her ultrasound of the right, it looks a bit strange. It doesn't look like that nice, clean, dark, anechoic implant we want to see. We can see some kind of hazy appearances, but it all looks like it's within the implant capsule. Um, in her left breast, you can actually see silicon outside of her implant capsule, this kind of snowstorm appearance. Um, and you can also see it in her superior left breast. Um, so does anyone want to hazard a guess at what they think has happened in this case? Um, so, so we did an MR just to check anyway. Um, and so she's got this kind of classic linguine sign in both breasts. So she definitely has at least intracapsular rupture. Um, but on her um, axial uh, water suppression sequences, we could actually see a bit of silicon in that left breast, just where we scan on the ultrasound, actually outside of her fibrous capsule. So this would be in keeping with extracapsular rupture. Um, and um, so then you're kind of, uh, at that point, usually the patient can feel it. And if it's been there for a while, she could have formed silicon granulomas. Um, and usually we take it out. Um, although it's a bit controversial because obviously they usually have to have it taken out in the private sector. So um, there's that kind of whole kind of um, can of worms when you to open when you do see extra capsule rupture. Um, just going on to um, the next case, this is just to show the kind of challenges that you can get when you have um, patients with implants. So there's several things going on here. So this is a woman who was having increased risk screening. So she's 44, but she was having regular mammograms as part of our increased risk screening service. And we found her to have some new calcification in her right breast. Um, just to zoom in, so that reflects, can you guys see that? Sort of, yeah. Um, she's got some new calcification in her right breast. So normally for this, we would do a stereotactic biopsy, which I don't know if you've seen it, but it's it's a really massive needle that kind of goes in. Um, so as much as possible, it's got a really strong suction as well. So we can't guarantee that her implant will be intact afterwards. Luckily in this case, we, were man we managed to see it with ultrasound and we did some biopsies and it came back as positive. And the next job, our job is to see is was the biopsy that we did in the right place for calcium and does it match up with her other findings in her breast? So she had a dynamic contrast enhanced MRI um, for her, um, to, the biopsy came back as DCIS, so to sort of stage her DCIS. But um, funnily enough, on that contrast MRI, um, you can see there's all these, this, you see these thin strands, sorry, this one. Um, you see these thin strands sort of hanging around in her implant. Um, that is, again, sort of linguine sign in keeping with intracapsular rupture. Her left implant's intact, so you can see that's a double thickness fold on the left, and it's just all continuous with her implant capsule. Um, so she has intracapsular rupture as well as um, DCIS in that breast. Just going back to that mammogram, you can sort of see this double kind of strange density where her silicon implant was, so you can probably see that it has ruptured on the mammogram. Um, and yeah, where that clip is, that corresponds to where um, her increased enhancement is in keeping with DCIS. Um, interestingly, you could actually see her intracapsular rupture on her CT from four years earlier. This is performed at another hospital, um, but it was just to highlight that you can actually see these things on CT sometimes. So her left implant's intact, but her right one, you can just see this kind of free hanging loose piece of her um, silicon shell um, on the implant. Um, so there's a bunch of signs, as I mentioned, 
earlier about that we see with intracapsular rupture. The most kind of classic sign is that Linguini sign, like a free kind of um, free floating strand of the implant capsule. Um, the subcapsular line sign is where you can actually see that kind of um, inner capsule kind of withdraw from the fibrous capsule. Um, but if you've got um, water mixing in or more, you see it more in a double lumen implant, if it ruptures, you can see something called salad oil sign where you see the water and silicon kind of interact and form kind of globules. Um, and the keyhole sign is just that uh, where that black arrow is pointing. Um, and you just see basically silicon in between that fold, which you shouldn't do if it's intact. Am I doing for time? 23. Um, this is another example of that salad oil sign when a double lumen implant ruptures. So you can see those globules of silicon kind of um, mixing um, with um, saline. Um, this is just another case to show just how challenging implants can be. So um, this is a patient with new nipple discharge and um, her mammogram is normal. We did the Eklund view and it looked at normal on her Eklund view. Um, because she had nipple discharge, we always do an ultrasound just to check and see if there's anything um, behind the nipple. And in her case, we did find this irregular 15 millimeter area that we biopsied. Um, it is very close to the implants. So we're always really cautious that we always consent them that we could rupture it. Um, just before we do the biopsy, just uh, obviously we avoid it as much as possible, but it's good for them to know that that could be the case. Um, this came back as um, a grade three cancer, and um, you can see on the MRI, um, it's just this area of increased enhancement just lateral to her left nipple. Um, and she did actually have a CT. Her implants are intact. It's just... Um, just nice to show that you can actually just see this slight increased density and that's our little marker clip that we put in from the biopsy. Um, just another case of sort of weird presentations of implants. So um, this woman had this lump at the inferior aspect of her left breast. It's got that kind of really ugly snowstorm artifact appearance. Um, so this made us suspicious is this silicon that's outside of her implant. And um, Again, we saw um, silicon outside of her implant in keeping with extracapsular rupture. Um, this is just another case of really severe extracapsular rupture. This is when you can see it on the mammogram. Uh, you can see all this really horrible, irregular density. Um, when silicon has been in the breast long enough free, it starts to form silicon granuloma. So it can lay down calcium and cause really horrible necrotic fibrosis reactions. Um, this woman on her ultrasound had free silicon everywhere. Her MRI, you can just see it's just a complete, this is all silicon in her breast that's extra fixated. So free silicon in the breast is discrete foci, definitely consistent with extra capsule rupture. The more subtle ones are like the ones I showed at the start where it's just outside the fibrous capsule. Um, and it can look quite scary even on MRI, it can form granulomas which show enhancement and then you can start thinking is this a cancer? So then if you're ever unsure, you know, we always biopsy to check that it isn't a cancer and it is just silicon. Um, at some point there was a fear that, in, you know, ruptured implants would cause, have a link with connective tissue diseases, but that's shown not to be true. Um, this is a 34 year old patient who had bilateral breast implants for com cosmetic reasons. And when she presented to us, we saw this really funny looking, um, you know, mixed echogenicity, um, essentially a lump sitting in her actual implant capsule. Um, so the worry is, is this cancer? Is this rupture? Um, anything else you think that we should worry that this could be? Or Those are the big ones, right? So. Um, so she had a dynamic contrast in her um, MRI. And we can see this lump, it is sitting in the capsule, um, but it was fairly low signal on T1 and T2, didn't show any enhancement on our contrast enhanced um, phases. Um, and this turned out to be a hematoma, which actually is quite common as well sometimes, but you always really worry with any new lump, you know, we have to biopsy it to check it's not lymphoma and check it's not you know, a new breast cancer, but even the implant related cancer. Um, this is a woman who had, the implants hadn't changed at all, but she could feel some lumps in her left underarm. 
So we had a look with ultrasound and it looked like she had um, that classic snowstorm appearance in her nodes um, and they were enlarged, same keeping silicon nodes. Um, I guess the fear at this point is, has she ruptured her implant? Um, so we did an MRI um, and it showed, oh, we've gone too far, but the implant was intact, but you can see on this water suppression sequence, we could see this bright signal in keeping with silicon in her nodes. Um, so, so this was in keeping with silicon adenopathy from a sort of slow gel bleed. Um, you can also see it on this axial water suppression sequence. Um, interestingly enough, again, this CT was performed at a different unit. You can actually see these big chunky nodes on her CT as well. And they're not as chunky as they are sort of two years later when she can feel them, um, but they are there. They just look like big brown nodes on CT. I tried to see if there was a cool way to work out if it had silicon in, but as far as I know, there isn't. But it's just good for someone with implants, even if they're intact, if you see big chunky nodes, you could always query it and we can always have a look with ultrasound and MRI. Check the implants are okay. Um, this is a 73 year old woman who had an implant reconstruction 20 years ago. She then actually 13 years ago had a rupture of her original implant on her left side. So had a new implant put in um, and then she presented to us with a lump in her left upper outer quadrant. And what's happening here is, um, let's see if there's any bigger, nice picture. So we did an ultrasound and again, we saw that. So the implant looked intact. But we did see um, just next to the implant and just superior to it, again, that kind of classic snowstorm and um, big, ugly, um, not ugly, but I don't know if you think it's ugly, but um, this big kind of um, snowstorm appearance kind of outside the implant. And I guess what you'd worry about is, is this extra capsular rupture? But the implant looked really nice and beautiful and intact and anechoic. And what you can find is, on her implant study from five years ago, she actually already had this. And this is an example of a silicon granuloma. So this is from her previous rupture. That granuloma has stayed there and got bigger and now become painful, but her actual more recent implant was intact on this MRI study. I think it shows better on there. Um, um, so that was fine. We didn't need to worry. The implant was intact and this was just old silicon from her previous rupture. Um, so, so this is, yeah, this, part and parcel all the challenges we see with um, implants and trying to diagnose things in them. So obviously they're at risk of the standard things. So cysts, fibroadenomas, um, fat necrosis, um, cancers, but also there's a whole range of implant related problems. So for example, um, post-surgical hematomas. Um, if you feel a lump, a lump in a woman with an implant, it could be a silicon granuloma. Um, also very common implant folds um, and bulges. Um, also, it could be the implant valve if they have like an expander implant. Um, and even after you take the implant out, you could probably still feel lumps from sort of calcified bits of the capsule that remain after you've taken it out. Um, you can sometimes see that calcified capsule on CT if it's been there a long time as well. Um, this is an interesting case in that, so this was picked up on CT. or this, Well, this patient had a CTPA for shortness of breath. And she had previous implants put in for cosmetic reasons, um, but has recently had a mastectomy. And these were her CT appearances. Um, so the, the mastectomy was on the left side. So they want to say what they think is going on maybe on this. To make it sort of more interesting. So obviously prior to her mastectomy, this is what her CT looked like uh, on the right side. And then sort of about a year later now, her CT looks like this. And um, so essentially, so what's happened with this patient is, so just going sort of pedaling back. Um, so back in January, um, before she actually had the CT on the right side, which was to stage her cancer, um, she was found to have um, grade three breast cancer in her left breast. Um, so obviously when we take the cancer, you know, in her case, she had um, a skin sparing mastectomy, but when we take the cancer out, we also take the implant out and, you know, we put a new one in. And um, so, you know, in her case, we put an expander implant in. So this is silicon on the outside and saline in the inner lumen. Um, and it's just to be 
aware of, you can actually see the port both on the MRI and on the um, CT scan that you can use to help expand that inner saline lumen. Um, but obviously the, the, the problem was that this got picked up as an intracapsular rupture. And actually this is just a normal dual lumen implant. And um, you know, that's its nice port. And um, the MRI was nice and normal. Both implants are intact. Um, this is actually a great pickup from someone here. So um, this is a localizer on a, an MRI pelvis scan. And just on that very last image, um, someone's picked up, um, can you see these extra lines? So this is a dual lumen implant, um, but she's got these extra lines in her kind of saline outer capsule. And that makes us worried about intracapsular rupture. So this is where you really can add value just by looking at the implants. and. Um, absolutely, we then did our kind of fancy breast implant MRI protocol, and we can see that the so the inner saline lumen is intact, but she's ruptured the shell that surrounds her silicon capsule. It's still intracapsular rupture because her fibrous capsule is intact. Um, this was just a really nice pickup uh, on a localizer. It always pays to look at the localizer, to be honest. Um, so that was really nice. Um, I don't want to go to so I've got another six minutes. So. Um, this is a case of a 43 year old who's noticed a change in the implant texture. Um, and you can see this is just intracapsular rupture with um, that subcapsular line sign. Um, but she also had some chunky nodes and these are the nodes that are taking up um, silicon on her water suppression sequence. Um, this case calls does uh, gives a bit of a scare, but essentially this woman could feel this mass-like lump on top of her right dual lumen, dual lumen breast implant. Um, and it was initially sent to us as pre-rupture, um, but we saw this and then we got worried that she might have a low-grade lymphoma um, as it seemed to be based within the implant capsule. Um, so we did our fancy MRI, we couldn't see any silicon inside this which made us more worried this was lymphoma because it didn't look like a, um, you know, a silicon granuloma and um, the next step would be to biopsy this. So we looked at it on ultrasound and um, it's got this nice kind of um, lace-like appearance, um, didn't show any um, enhancement or any blood flow on Doppler. Um, so this thankfully turned out to be a hematoma. So it wasn't anaplastic um, large cell lymphoma. But it's always really important to just be aware of it always. So it's fine to have an effusion in that first year after an implant, but we really worry if there's a new effusion, a delayed effusion, many years after you've had an implant inserted. Um, it's more common in textured implants, but it's just the risk is very, very low. And it's, it is a very, very rare and late complication. Um, but it's just for us to be aware that we shouldn't see new fluid around an implant years after they've had the implant in. And um, when it is just, so it can either be a mass or fluid, but when you see fluid, it should be um, between the shell and the capsule mostly. What we do is we aspirate that fluid and we can send it off to the lab for flow cytometry. And they can look for fancy things like CD30 cells. Um, and if it's a mass, obviously we do a tissue biopsy. Um, so obviously I, we don't have a case from one that we've had here. As far as I know, we've not had one here, if that's fair. Um, but these are the cases in the literature. So you just, either get this brand new, really horrible kind of fluid around the implant, um, or you can get sort of mass-like areas within that fluid which need to be biopsied. Um, obviously there is a differential diagnosis for fluid around an implant. So the other things to think about are infection and seroma, usually in the more early stages, um, and obviously implant rupture, which we talked about, and hematoma are also really common. Um, sort of the last couple of cases, um, this is a 59 year old. Um, again, this is picked up on her routine CT. So um, does anyone want to say what they think is happening on this CT? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, no, you perfect. So this was her. So she was actually having the CT again for just ovarian cancer follow up. Um, that was her implant six months earlier, um, nice and intact. And now her implant looked like that in September 21. So absolutely intracapsular rupture. And that was... Um, and we, we did our fancy MRI just to prove it, but absolutely you can tell on the CT it's ruptured. Uh, and that's all that, you know, the subcapsular line sign and the keyhole sign all in one. Um, the last case is just, of, again, just something that you can see. Uh, it can just crop up on any modality really. So 
And this is a woman uh, with previous skin sparing mastectomy um, and had an implant reconstruction. She's had, um, since her reconstruction, she's had two areas of DCIS found on skin biopsies. Um, and so, you know, she's had a pet, well, she had an MRI and we found this really chunky intramammary node um, and then had a PET CT. So we can see it on the, um, on her MRI scan, but it also lit up on the PET CT. And um, with two recurrence DCIS, I guess the fear was, has she got the current? Um, and even on the PET CT, you know, the fear was this is all in keeping with the currents. Had a really extensive full mastectomy and, um, you know, clearance of her intramammary nodes and auxiliary nodes. Um, and it was all fine. It all turned out to be just a bit of silicon that's leaked and caused um, reactive changes. So um, just to emphasize that sometimes even if the implant is intact, um, you can get gel bleeds, which is basically the micro pores in the implant can allow slow amounts of silicon to escape and then it can go distally in the body so it can go usually in the auxiliary nodes but it can also go to the intramammary nodes um and um but in her case the silicon shell was completely intact um so just sort of a whirlwind tour of kind of some of the challenges and pitfalls and plants and causes um mri is the modality of choice but you can see it on other modalities so it's always worth just to have a look um, and if you're ever unsure, you can just show us or um, we can have a look with ultrasound. Um, it's really useful to know the knowledge of the type of reconstruction. So if you know if it's a double lumen or a single lumen, um, but early diagnosis is better to save them going down that kind of horrible silicon granuloma route and things. This looks like a smiley face to me. I don't know if it looks like a smiley face to you, but yeah, <laughs> thanks for listening. <laughs>